So I would, and thank you, Scott, for that introduction. I would uh, like to take the hour that, that we have to tell you about interactive design tools for the maker movement. So over the next hour, I'll show you how new tools can help you rapidly create functional enclosures from 3D scans of sculpted objects, um, how you can debug breadboarded circuits by automatically finding and, and flagging errors, and how you can make an arbitrary 3D printed shape interactive by just adding a camera. Now, these tools are all aimed at the growing ranks of the maker movement, so maybe before we jump into the technical work, let's back up first and start at the beginning. So, what is the maker movement? Who in the audience considers themselves uh, a maker? So not too many. Um, for, for me, what's exciting about the maker movement is that it's this bottom-up effort to engage people from all ages and walks of life in learning how our world of products uh, works. Uh, makers gain hands-on skills to actively participate in shaping that world, like this electronics workshop here in Detroit that's just a couple miles away from the Packard plant, which is one of the biggest industrial ruins from uh, prior generations in the U.S. So makers include everyone from engineers and, and artists, and for me, the key component here is that it turns you into an active participant rather than a, a passive consumer. Uh, ground zero for the maker movement, and part of the reason why I'm, I probably got so interested in it was the, is, is and was the Maker Fair that's been running for a little over 10 years now. And I actually used to live right down the street from the San Mateo Fairground, so the first Maker Fair, I just walked down the street and into it. Um, it started at 20,000 participants. It's now at more than 100,000 at the flagship event. Uh, about 800,000 or so um, people attend annually one of these events worldwide. Now, makerspaces are also appearing in many universities. So I got to visit the Envision makerspace here. I know you also have plan grant plans for the future. And uh, this is mirrored at other universities. So Yale has a new Center for Engineering Innovation and Design. The Invention Studio at Georgia Tech was one of the early examples. Um, Case Western has a seven-floor building, uh, ThinkBox. And now we're seeing actually conferences appearing on the role of making in, in higher education. So clearly there's lots of interest. But why does it matter? So what's at stake? Um, I'll give you three reasons. The first one is a, a quote from favorite Bay Area philosopher Alan Watts that I'll just let you read. And what I think is interesting about this quote is, this quote is from the 60s, right? 
And uh, I think in, in some ways we've turned that crank for a couple more decades to the point where I've now seen um, graduate electrical engineers enter Berkeley's program, of course educated at other unnamed universities, um, that are ACES analytically, but that have never actually built a working circuit. So there's, um, there's a role here of how, how making can uh, reshape education. There's also a role, um, as Eric von Hippel argues, that making has a big role in the innovation pipeline that we may have uh, nationally or internationally, and that is that many innovations come from extreme users. So innovations in sports equipment like uh, snowboards come from professional athletes. Innovations in medical devices often come from physicians and, and nurses. Excellent. Well, you should go to his talk, <laughs> and you should read his book. <laughs> um, and a um, connected to the source of innovation is is then also the question about the competence in making and manufacturing uh, nationwide. And so, five years ago, there was an article and on Forbes that basically argued that. Amazon couldn't make a Kindle in the U.S. even if it wanted, and even if economics were not an art, were uh, not the hurdle. It's just that all of the know-how around how to make things, uh, logistics, manufacturing, etc., has all moved out, um, largely moved out of the country and in the, into the um, uh, Colorado River Delta region. Now, the last administration took note, and so uh, three years ago, the first. White House Maker Faire was, was held, and they were uh, to be followed by national Maker Faires that brought projects from all 50 states together. It's, I guess, an open question what, um, what happens under the current administration. Um, at Berkeley, we're also very interested in, in the role that making can play in education, and so um, I've been very lucky to, to have been involved in for the last four years in first planning and then building and now running the Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation. So the very brief high-level statement is that we support students in learning design process, much like the design lab here at UC San Diego, um, understanding the, the nature of wicked problems and how to tackle them, um, understanding and defining unmet needs in the world around them. So here are pictures from a bioengineering summer program that sends students out into local hospitals to observe physicians, nurses, technicians, and come up with, um, with new needs and then turn those into ideas that they then prototype and test. And we hope to give students the, the substrate to make all of that possible. So here's the 10,000 foot view of what the Jacobs Institute does. Uh, we have a curricular program, we have co-curricular activities, and we have a public-facing side. So on the curricular side is we, des we introduce a set of design innovation courses uh, that didn't exist at the university before. We host courses from uh, many other departments on campus. We're at home in the College of Engineering, but open to the entire university. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we also launched with uh, with three other colleges, the Berkeley Certificate in Design Innovation. So a campus-wide certificate that is, think of it as an interdisciplinary minor that uh, aimed at undergraduates that, um, that give you kind of a guide through the breadth of offerings at, at Berkeley. Um, so co-curricular, we run a large maker space and run a program called the Maker Pass, which gives you access to the lab and, and those tools, not just in our building, but also in other buildings on campus. We run design night workshops where students can learn about particular skills in one particular area. And then we have a quite sizable program of students cl student clubs and decal classes. So I don't know if this e exists at San Diego. Decal stands for Democratic Education at Cal, and a very Berkeley notion. These are student design and student run classes, and um, they rival um, the faculty-led classes in size and enthusiasm of, of students. So basically every night after 6 p.m. from 6 11 to 11 p.m. we turn the whole building over to the students to run these classes and, and club meetings. And then we have public uh, semesterly showcases where all of the, the classes exhibit projects. We have talk series like this one and then also uh, certain outside events. 
Roughly, this is at the scale where we're operating on right now. So we usually have about 10 departments per semester in the building, about 20 different courses. In the spring, which we just finished, so we're done for uh, this academic year, um, we had over 900,000 um, students and, and staff and faculty who signed up for our makerspace and about 1,200 students who come through our classes. And of course, this would only, is only possible through you know, having a, a larger network of folks. And so the faculty who are involved in uh, SPAN Mechanical Engineering, the business school, uh, bioengineering, we have participation from integrative biology, uh, civil, um, and kind of a, a broad range of, of departments. Here's just a quick snapshot of how we think of our curriculum. So everything in teal, these are new things we introduced that we made up of whole cloth that didn't exist before. And then things in gray are classes that either already existed uh, on campus or that you know, we provided the necessary activation energy for departments to um, offer new classes in, in those areas. So we start with a survey, discovering design. How is graphic de design related to engineering design, related to user experience design? Uh, because no one comes in with a design major to Berkeley. And so this is kind of the understanding the broader scope and where your interests might fit in. And then we have a series of skill classes from um, design methods to visual communication and hands-on fabrication and prototyping. Those prepare students for classes in their discipline. Those sometimes uh, are harder for other students to join because sometimes there are prerequisites, et cetera. But then on top of that, we layer project courses that are interdisciplinary at the junior, senior level. Um, here are just some of the topics that we've had in the now two years of operation of the in institute. So bio-inspired design coming from biology, um, close to my own heart, UI design, user experience design, courses on design leads to manufacturing, um, and then courses like reimagining mobility, reimagining slums. Those are the interdisciplinary uh, topics that, that uh, pull from students from different domains. All right. So those are a whole bunch of words. Let me also show you a couple of projects that, that have come out. Um, Sophie Superhand is a very mechanically oriented uh, project of looking into DIY prosthetics. So um, Sophie was born with um, a deformity in one of her hands and then worked with students um, to come up with her own superhero hand that in terms of functionality uh, and engineering parameters doesn't rival what you would get out of uh, state-of-the-art medical prosthetics, but it completely shifted the ownership and pride in the object from something you are given and may, might want to hide to something you say, I made this, um, I co-created this. Um, here's some projects out of a class that I teach together with Paul Wright from Mechanical Engineering, a class called Interactive Device Design. Um, we just exited our drought in, in California, and, um, but uh, I think going forward, who knows how long this season, uh, this rainy spell will last. So water monitoring uh, is, kinda, uh, is near and dear to us. So here's a project of a fixture level uh, water flow monitor that the students 3D printed an impeller that has magnets uh, on the periphery. So as water rushes through the pipe, it starts spinning. It induces a current in a coil on the outside. That's enough to power up a microcontroller to sense how much current is flowing, which it then sends over Bluetooth to your phone. And one of the beautiful aspects here is so it's really multiple different domains coming together. Based on the initial motivation was, well, Clearly, you don't want to run a power cable into your shower. That's a bad idea. So how do we give you that functionality, that experience, in, uh, entirely self-powered? Uh, we're also doing projects with UCSF. That's our uh, medical center. They now have a campus in Oakland and otherwise right across the bay in San Francisco. Um, there are many, many insights and ideas uh, arising in the medical era 
area that with a little bit of maker spirit and, and ingenuity, you can turn into working prototypes. So this is a prototype to tackle a problem called sensory ataxia, where you lose feeling in uh, your feet. Um, so some of the nerve endings aren't uh, correctly relaying signals anymore. And so if you've ever taken a controls class, think of it as you're starting to walk open loop without feedback. And so that leads to falls, which lead to many other medical complications. So here, the insight was, well, why don't we just relay that signal to nerve endings that still work? So some pressure sensors in the soles of, of your shoes that just send a wireless signal of every footfall three feet up to uh, your back where you wear cell phone vibration motor off the shelf parts that uh, can give you a vibration on every footfall. And within 10, 15 minutes, um, people can incorporate this feedback signal as, oh, this is what walking feels like now. Here's a final example of this is a wearable for firefighters um, who, um, so the students did some need finding work and discovered that uh, all of the coordination in firefighter, in firefighting is actually, it's a star network. It's individual firefighters com communicating <laughs> with a chief who sits outside in a van or SUV and the chief integrates all of the um, information. And so this is a wearable that shows no information to the firefighter uh, themselves. They're busy enough, but it sends um, a camera feed, a thermal imaging feed where you can, that allows you to tell where there are bodies uh, in, in rooms. Uh, as well as a gas sensor and a gas pressure sensor which tells the commander how, how many minutes does that firefighter have left before we need to pull them out. So those last three projects are to me indicative of a whole range of projects that happen in our institute and that is they all live at this intersection of their physical products that run code. There's some custom or off the shelf electronics and then there's kind of a larger user interaction story that ties all of that together. And so I think the sweet spot of our institute is really right in the middle of, of these different domains. Now, I've told you a little bit about the framing of the institute and when it, what kind of classes and projects happen. So now let me pivot a little bit and tell you about how this kind of work now also motivates and inspires my research in human-computer interaction. And so the larger theme I'm thinking about is what should the 21st century makerspace look like, right? What is the physical and virtual environment that gives you all of the tools you need to um, learn about uh, new processes and turn ideas into working prototypes or products. And what's motivating here is, you know, think of back then it wasn't called a makerspace, it was called a workshop. But one of the, the great uh, anecdotes to me is uh, how the Wright brothers, you know, demonstrated the first controllable human flight based on their experience as bi bicycle mechanics and manufacturers. And so their makerspace was basically, you know, in the uh, great new inventions of the 19th century, which is um, a central engine somewhere and then a drive shaft that, um, that distributed rotation everywhere so you could have power tools that gave you leverage to build larger prototypes faster. And so the question is, what's that workshop, what's that makerspace for the 21st century? And to me, there are three core ingredients. That is, everything is nowadays driven by powerful design software. Design software increasingly controls digital fabrication tools. So the kind of automation we've seen at industrial scale for the last decades is now rapidly moving into prototyping shops and even individual garages. And then you have ubiquitous programmable electronics that you can run code anywhere and everywhere and all of that code is also wirelessly connected. So those are the technical ingredients. And then another question is, well, how would we help people in the process? Makers are pretty an in, a pretty enterprising bunch, right? Do they need research? So I see, uh, I see two different areas where new tools can especially help makers. The first one is in the design process. So here is a somewhat canonical view, right? This is the synthesis of 
many different models of, of the design process. And um, one thing you can do is, at the core is really this design prototype evaluate cycle. Right? And so one thing that better tools can do is make this cycle faster. So you can have more iterations and be more confident that you had a good solution before you run out of time or money and it's time to, to ship or show your final project as it, as it may be in a class. So how do you make this cycle faster? Well, one is you can lower the expertise threshold that's required to just prototype in different technologies. And the second one is you can actually substitute two technologies, get you to the same end result by not actually requiring you to build custom electronics. Um, all right. So that's one way we can help. Um, on the other hand, makers are also learners. Right? I think one of the things that, that is key to the maker movement is that makers use projects to generate a pull for conceptual knowledge just in time. I'm motivated that I want to build this thing and for, in order for me to be able to successfully build the thing, I now have to learn a whole bunch of skills along the way. And so you can also help that learning activity. And I think a particularly useful um, point of leverage is how to go from observation to kind of a conceptualization, especially in when things don't go right, right? When things go wrong, how do you help me go from it doesn't do the thing it was supposed to do to what's the underlying pattern that might explain that. All right, so back to this diagram of um, electromechanical software widgets. Um, I'm gonna share with you three different projects that my group has undertaken in that space um, that either aim at making prototyping faster or aim at the, the learning piece. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about enclosure design which lies at the intersection of mechanical and, and electronic questions about how to just debug circuits that you build, which is squarely in the realm of electronics, and then how to do interaction prototyping. So kind of the higher level concern of what should you be able to do with, a, with an object that you built. Okay, so let's take it from the top. So 3D printers are now ubiquitously used both in maker spaces and in professional practice. Uh, this is a picture here from Microsoft's hardware lab um, showing you how different uh, 3D printed prototypes are used to check for ergonomics and maybe also placement of, of components. However, if you just print something out of the 3D printer, what you have is a piece of plastic, right? It's passive. It doesn't do anything. Interactions with this game controller wouldn't be captured. It's not a, it's not a game controller, just a piece of plastic. So, if you actually want to create an interactive artifact, well then, pretty quickly you step out of the realm of prototyping and into the realm of electromechanical co-design. So how do I now shape this thing that it not just fits a human hand, but that a circuit board fits inside and that the components are just mounted right? And that is really the realm of complex, detailed, labor-intensive CAD, which is kind of at odds with the spirit of just trying an idea out quickly. So we were motivated by what you might find in you know, low-fidelity prototyping activities where people just take sculpting material and say, well, this bicycle mount for my phone should roughly look like this. Right? So people can express design intent through rough sculpting a form, but actually, Many of us are not so good at that sculpting, and so things end up looking not quite how we want them to look, but also it's really hard through sculpting to um, indicate how you want something to work. So here, green blob means you know, put a ball joint here. We didn't model the ball joint, it's just a stand-in. And so when we ran a formative study, people would sculpt the kind of geometry intent, and then they would start making a drawing as well and put annotations on it and say, this part really should serve the following function, and this other part should use the following function. So um, that combination of sculpting plus annotations led us to think about a workflow where what if we gave you sculpting materials and a set of annotation markers that you can place to indicate uh, a specific intent that you have. So you could build 
quickly build models like this. So here's a game controller out of Sculpey with some stickers stuck on top of it. And then if we had a library of supported electronic components, right, could we turn this sketch, 3D sketch at the bottom, into a working functional object at the bottom? So this is the Maker's Max project. Um, here's how it works. You um, sculpt your shape, and then you take our library of just paper markers, which all correspond to electronic components, and then you 3D scan the whole contraption. We then get a 3D model and lots of texture images from the 3D scanner. And then we apply standard computer vision models to locate those marks that we know what they are. We've designed them in the uh, texture images from the 3D scanner. Once we've detected them in the 2D image, we project that back into the texture 3D model. So we know at this point the user would like to have a, a joystick there. And so then we can modify that 3D geometry based on an underlying model of what that joystick component is. For example, we know it has about the following size and it needs the following type of geometry to mount it into a shell. So based on re recognizing those markers, we can then perform automatic shelling of the object, automatic geometry modification. We punch holes wherever a user interacts with an input component. We generate mounting bosses and mounting clips so that when you 3D print your object, you can then just snap the different components in one by one. And so here's what uh, a printed artifact would look like from the, um, the model I've shown you before. All right, so key ideas here in, in, this, in this project is the maker expresses shape intent through sculpting and then functionality intent through placement of these different marks. Um, the tool handles all of that tedious geometry generation and modification. Now there's one big caveat, and that is that it relies on having this metadata of all these different components available. Right? You need to know what the geometry of every single component is so you can do that automatically. Now it turns out, as a research project, that sounds really tedious and like not something anyone would ever want to do. Except when you look at the commercial realm, this is already happening because it's a value-added serv uh, service offering for a distributor. So who in, has anyone in the room ever ordered something from McMaster Car? So McMaster is, you know, it is the go-to source for mechanical parts. Uh, fasteners, rods, sheet goods, and every single uh, product they sell has a CAD model that comes along with it because it makes you more likely to order the part from them than from one of their competitors. So having this kind of metadata broadly available, I think the market will take care of it and that enables, that will then enable design tools such as these to work. All right. It was a, a rapid tour through um, how to help with enclosure design. Let's move to circuit debugging. Okay, show of hands, who in the room has breadboarded a circuit before? Okay, that's roughly half of you. Um, for those of you who haven't breadboarded a circuit before, the, um, the solderless breadboard is a great invention in user experience design from the 1970s because it basically allows you to quickly define the connectivity of a circuit by just plugging components and wires into um, an array of spring-loaded contacts. And so underneath the hood, you plug components in here. In the middle, things that you plug into the same row are connected, and on the power rails, everything you plug into power or ground is, is connected as well. So I think that's what I just told you. Now, this has really sped up um, how quickly you can put a working circuit together. However, a couple of challenges with breadboards. So there's a bug somewhere <laughs> in this design. Can you locate it? <laughs> it's the other green wire. <laughs> so. Um, I like to think of breadboards sometimes as a, it's a write-only medium. Like you build something, but you can never understand 
quite what it is that, that you built. And in fact, uh, just uh, last year at CHI, there was a, um, a great paper just running a study documenting the problems students in physical computing, tangible interface classes have in working um, with these types of projects, uh, primarily pointing out that you know, we've developed a whole set of debugging support in software and we're lacking analogous support once you move into the, the hardware domain. And so even just locating where your problem is is a major hurdle. So our hypothesis is debugging here is difficult because much of the state of the system is hidden or very difficult to uh, examine, even when you can look at it. So how would you debug a breadboarded circuit? Well, you break out your multimeter and you do a point-wise measurement, right? You come up with an hypothesis, what could be wrong, and then you put two probes down and say, what about that hypothesis? Or maybe you're not uh, just um, interested in a static value, but in values over time, so you break out the oscilloscope. And once again, you do a single point measurement. All right, so here's the research idea. Taking point measurements requires that you have a hypothesis about what the underlying problem is. We know from prior studies of programmers that non-experts are not that great at generating reasonable hypotheses. Right? Just coming up with the right hypothesis, that is a sign of skill. So let's replace the individual point measurements with ubiquitous instrumentation where we measure everything all the time. And then, instead of just throwing all of those numbers at you, combine some information about what it is you're trying to build, like a circuit model, with those real-world measurements to proactively diagnose what the problem could be. So the project here is called the toast, the toast board, the, the better bread board. Um, and we can basically scan the whole board at around 200 hertz, so every single row and get the voltages. And then we, just, we can just show you the voltages on, directly on the board itself. However, probably more useful is there's also a virtual breadboard which can then visualize all of that information uh, um, in software. So we show you voltages not just as colors but also as values. And then because we can continuously scan, we can show you all of those voltages as you build up a circuit. So as soon as you plug, a, plug in a wire, here's your voltage. Um, and as you then continuously build up uh, your circuit, we'll, we'll give you the information along the way. Okay. So just the voltages are maybe already useful, but we can, do, uh, we can be more helpful if you also tell us what the circuit is you're trying to build. So if you give us a virtual model of the circuit by just dragging and dropping components, then we can automatically run some checkers based on what you just told us you're trying to build. So for example, if we see a drop of 3.3 volts across uh, an LED, that is not what we would expect based on the data sheet of, of a common LED. And so we can say, that is unusually large. We don't quite know what the single cause of error is. There could be multiple causes of errors, but two of them are, you could have inserted that LED backwards, you have reverse polarity, or it could actually be broken. We can also give you uh, additional um, information, such as using Ohm's law to just calculate the current and just populate that information on the breadboard itself. I think this is just a, a live demo of this, so here, I'm reversing that LED, so now it went from reading one and a half volts in the middle to zero, and so we give you uh, an error right on the circuit, and if you correct that mistake, that, that error will then clear. Okay, so we can do that for individual components. Uh, another source of confusion and errors are uh, integrated circuits, right? complex packages with a bunch of leads where you have to consult the data sheet to know what to connect where. And so we can just encode the knowledge that is in that data sheet in the virtual component that you place on the board, right? So here, for example, 
Uh, sometimes these, these things will seem arcane, and, but we can automatically detect, hey, a pin that you were supposed to connect for correct operation is not connected. So you're not going to get the performance that, that you were expecting. Can I just tell the software that I plugged in an LMC? Yeah, so here it says LMC 6482. So you need to select that from a menu, a library of parts, and, and place it. Yeah. Right now, that's manual. If we could do that automatically, without running the risk of damaging any of the components in, uh, um, in the process, that would be uh, an amazing next step. Um, the next thing you can do from data sheets is also, so here we're putting um, an ultrasonic sensor in. Any sensor, there's usually some complex transfer function which tells you how to read the individual bits that it's spitting out and turn it into a real world unit. Right? We can automatically perform that um, for you and give you here a graph in terms of centimeters of distance in, instead of um, just bytes that, uh, that a sensor spits out. Okay, so how does it work underneath the hood? So we take our breadboard, we peel off the bottom and stick it onto our own circuit board that is basically a multiplexer scan chain where we scan every row of the breadboard one by one with uh, an analog to digital converter. Then we take all of that information and forward it both back to the breadboard to the LED bars and to our software. So here's what our uh, PCB looks like. These are all the pads that you then just put the breadboard on top of. It's not just, I think we spend <laughs> weeks if not months on just uh, the mechanical, you know, making good contact between uh, a regular breadboard and, and our board. And then on the, on the bottom of the board, we then just take an off-the-shelf microcontroller board, you know, a $10, $15 uh, TI board that does all of that analog sampling and sends the data for, uh, to a computer. And then the rest that's what's left is this multiplexer scan chain, which just allows us to get with, you know, one or three analog to digital converters to every row on the breadboard. And then a pull-down network that brings all of the voltages into a uh, safe range for, for a microcontroller to read. Um, so a couple of, uh, we ran a, a small study so far. We're still trying to get up the, the time and resources required to make you know, dozens or hundreds of, of these boards. So now we've ran studies with both a small number of novices and experts where experts would be teaching you know, at the level of teaching assistance for an intro EE class. And so things like not even realizing that diodes have polarity, those are, those are the types of errors that the board can automatically flag for novices. And then experts said, well, for me, training someone else, this would certainly be uh, helpful in that it gives you that scaffolding. Um, but also, we've gotten some feedback now repeatedly questioning of, well, there's also a core skill of debugging that you learn some discipline in troubleshooting errors when each debugging step is costly. And so there's, there's maybe a, a worry on the flip side that when it becomes too easy um, to point out certain errors that you will become less systematic in uh, your own debugging practice. Maybe once you get to a level where that this board can't get support. Okay, but this is, um, so this tool really, our goal was here to hit um, at this stage to go between Observation, reflecting on observation to having a conceptualization of what's going wrong. Couple of limitations. This, uh, this doesn't yet work for arbitrary circuits. You have to be operate kind of within our parameters. This populating of virtual circuits, as I hinted upon, is cumbersome and can actually be a source of error in itself. Right? You have to align what you do in software with what you do in hardware. So it would be a great follow-on project to just solve that part identification problem. Um, the checker functions right now, they're at the component level. We don't yet do nodal analysis of, of full circuits. And there's also the chance that we haven't yet studied whether you know, all of those errors 
they may have multiple underlying sources, which of them are helpful versus potentially confusing. Next step we want to take this to is you built these circuits, but you know, in an age of uh, ubiquitous computing or IoT as we like to call it nowadays, um, those circuits are always interfacing with code. Right? It's very rare that someone just builds an analog standalone circuit. So how do you debug systems that, um, that where the functionality is designed both by the code that they run as well as the peripherals they interact with? So this was a, when we finished the, the project, this was a mock-up we generated. So it would look something like this. And uh, it ended up looking more like this. So if you uh, give me another couple of months, I could tell you about um, how uh, a project works where we can instrument and debug the code at the same time as all the, the signals in your circuit. And so the high level takeaway uh, so far is that it's immensely powerful to be able to graph a value that happened in the circuit right next to a variable value in your code that you collected at the same point in time. So we're uh, very hopeful that this will generate further follow-on research. All right, so that's, uh, that was the toast board. The idea here is ubiquitous instrumentation of the breadboard, measure everything all the time, and then combining physical measurements with even partial virtual component models to be able to give you more insight than just a number, than just you know 2.3 volts. And then providing these debugging hypotheses preemptively instead of requiring the user to come up with every hypothesis. All right, then we jump, jump ahead to the last project in interaction prototyping. And so I showed you one project where if you have a library of components, you could, maybe we can change the geometry so you can uh, slot electronic components in automatically. But maybe we could actually skip all of this electrical mechanical CAD design and let you just create the mechanical model. And um, if we just had one super sensor that could sense everything you do to a physical object, right? Then we could skip all of this detailed design, at least for the prototyping stage. So the best super sensor I know of is a camera. And so in the Sauron project, you 3D print um, the shape of an interactive device that has user input um, components, buttons, sliders, dials, et cetera. You add a camera to the model, and that then turns uh, your piece of plastic plus camera into an interactive artifact. All right. So the idea here is that before we ever 3D print the object, we're going to intervene at the CAD design stage. And we're going to take this 3D model that you designed, and then we're going to add a virtual camera to this model. And then anything that camera can see, we can perform computer vision tracking on it. Right? Now, as I show you though, here in red and in green, um, normally as if you design any complex shape, it's not clear that everything will actually be visible to the camera, right? So here, only the things in green are visible. Everything that's red is outside um, the visual field of a normal camera. But we haven't printed this object yet, right? So we can change the geometry of the object itself to make the computer vision task easier. So it's kind of the flip side of general computer vision where you try to come up with better algorithms to extract information from an unknown environment. Here we're applying al algorithms to change the shape of the environment to make very simple off-the-shelf computer vision work. So uh, this is now a top view. Here's your camera. Blue is the field of view. Let's say we have a button that's outside of that field of view. Or we can just change the geometry at the bottom of the button and just extrude it into the field of view. So here's an example object that uh, hopefully will drive that point home. There's one camera and you can, we just extrude from all different angles. Now that doesn't always work. So think about something is um, parallel to the optical axis or maybe behind a barrier. 
this case, we uh, take inspiration from basic computer graphics. So who remembers their ray tracing? You bounce rays into the scene, and when they hit an object, you reflect the ray by the surface normal. And we do that, and we look for rays that hit an, ob an area we want to sense with one bounce um, at the boundary of the object. Why would that make sense? Well, that gives us areas where wherever we bounce those rays off, if we just glue a small mirror inside, then the area you want it to see will become visible to the camera. So kind of a, a combination of some algorithmic smarts and then realizing that our users are makers. So why don't we just let them do a bit of manual work? So then you print your object, uh, and then comes the highly technical part of increasing computer vision accuracy, where you take a Sharpie and you just mark the ends of all the printed geometries. So you have, you have easy blobs to track in your blob tracking algorithm. You could also print in multiple colors, but uh, this is faster and cheaper. And then you glue in your mirrors, you add your camera, and then for each different type of component, we basically take a, a suitable off-the-shelf vision algorithm. So for this slider here, um, in this case, we're using some retroreflective tape instead of black markers, um, but same idea. We just find minimum and maximum extent of, um, of that motion. And for something like um, a trackball or a scroll wheel, we can do optical flow that gives us um, direction and amplitude of movements. And so we've built ergonomic and printed er ergonomic mice, and going back to my prior career uh, as a record label owner, DJ controllers. And we've also had um, students model and build DJ controllers, which convinced us that the basic approach, there's a little bit of design for that technology that you have to do, like you have to think about where would you place the camera, but uh, the students were easily able to integrate that into their design process and create working models. And then we also just downloaded a number of models from model repositories and checked whether our approach would be applicable to them. Um, for many, yes, where it doesn't work is if you have geometry that's connected by very thin bridges to the place where you would put a camera and then a single bounce, just uh, optical bounce, doesn't get you full visibility of the object. All right. So key ideas here, use computer vision sensing on the inside of fabricated objects and do co-design of geometry and the sensing techniques. And so we modify the shape to create a much easier computer vision problem. Let me show you one other thing. Turns out you can play off that same trick in a number of different uh, ways as well. So same conceptual approach. Now instead of using a camera, we can use a microphone. So here are a whole bunch of 3D printed um, user input widgets, and each of them will have 3D printed a little tine so that when, for example, a user would push this button, you deflect that tine. At some point, it starts slipping, and then it starts vibrating. And so if you put a microphone, like a contact microphone, somewhere uh, on that body, you get a signal of that vibration. So you can do that for uh, discrete, Inputs, you can also discretize continuous inputs like sliders. And so here's the whole trick of, of that technique. You can 3D print tines of different lengths. And so what can we control here? The breadth, the thickness, and the length of each tine. And so it turns out uh, if you look into a mechanical engineering textbook, this is a cantilevered beam, vibration of a cantilevered beam is characterized by a closed form solution. You don't even need machine learning. You just plug, this, plug the values of the geometry that you just created into this formula. So there is material properties, what material you're printing, and then just the height and the length of each time. And that gives you F0, which is the fundamental frequency that the thing is gonna vibrate at. So then you just stick a microphone on the object, record um, that sound, this is what the frequency spectrum of that sound roughly would look like. So there's a transient when you get that slip. 
which just sounds really noisy. But then afterwards, in steady state, there's that one frequency that clearly appears. That's F0. So we just wait for a lot of audio to occur. We skip the first x milliseconds and then read out the, you know, the FFT bin with the highest energy. And turns out, if you do that between, let's say, 1,000 and 2,000 hertz, you get very good recognition accuracies. Above that, the thing starts to vibrate and de decay too quickly that you can't easily track it with an algorithm. OK, so that's basically what I had to tell you. Let's pop back up five or 10 levels. How do these tools help makers? Well, I made an argument that they help in two different ways. Right? One is in speeding up the iteration cycle in prototyping. And the other one is helping to teach and explain what goes on in these complex systems that makers build. Key themes from the user's perspective, for prototyping, this is not new. This is kind of, <laughs> computer science has done this successfully for decades, right? Describe the goals at a higher level of abstraction. Let the tool take care of the mapping to uh, lower level operations. And maybe this is new, get more utility out of digital fabrication by intelligently combining automatic and manual processes. Because you have makers at their tar target audience, they're happy to do some manual steps. In terms of learning, um, there's an there's this interesting distinction between a black box and a glass box. So black box, you don't want to know what's happening under the hood. Like the computer vision in the Soren system, it should just do the right thing. But when you're trying to understand what the circuit is doing that you're building, what you actually need is a glass box abstraction, right? Where you can dive in and see uh, uh, underlying information when the complexity is kind of inherent to the task. A uh, couple of key technical themes here. I think broadly what motivates me is here is an integrated approach to the mechanical, electrical, and software aspects of, of projects. And, and the tools that industry has developed, you know, because of job specialization, tend to be very powerful for a single domain. And there's lots of value at thinking more broadly at what happens at the intersection of these different domains. Um, I told you about this, given high level specification, co-designing geometry and sensing approaches together. Right? That, ha that works in audio and computer vision sensing. And then apply ubiquitous sensing, work with real, rich real world data wherever possible in, uh, during design, during debugging, during fabrication, and at runtime. And one thing I didn't tell you about, but that I think there's lots of opportunity is integrate 3D scanning as a more useful tool. So I showed you just a brief glimpse into one project. Um, 3D scanning is very powerful, except right now you press go and then you get a soup of millions of triangles back. And it's very hard right now for users to uh, be productive with 3D scan data. So that's kind of outlook for the future. Um, some things I haven't yet really tackled in, in this talk that I think are interesting in the future. The maker movement is built on the sharing ethos, so that should really point us towards collaborative design tools. How can something, how can a solution that I found help you in, in your project? Um, physical construction and debugging is also seems like something where augmented reality um, would be useful. And I tend to think of augmented reality not as strap a display to your head, but integrate, let's say, projection directly onto the tool that you're holding. So you're showing useful digital um, information while you're performing some physical task. And then uh, really, you know, going forward, so we're very interested in using Jacobs Hall as this living lab where we can develop these technologies and also deploy them with, with uh, kind of a large local user base. Okay. To finish up, of course, I just get to talk about this work. Um, here are all the fantastic students and postdocs who made all of the projects possible that you saw today. And with that, I'd like to close. And thank you for your time and open up to questions. Thank you.